Hello everyone, welcome again to another episode of Hair Brain Games, the week in games. What a week it's been. All my whining about weather, well we finally got at least a small precipice of 74.5 degree weather, and I'll take it. Um, enough of my whining, I hope you all had a very righteous 4th of July, I sure did. I had kids, I had grandkids, we had fireworks, we had a barbecue like no other. My son and his perfecting, constantly perfecting recipe for smoked ribs. I used a flat iron skillet, made some chicken, had tater salad, watermelon, homemade ice cream. Wow, I want to go back to that day. Anyway, hope you're all doing well. Uh, let's just roll into it and get to the news. Okay, in the news, we have news of oh, an unsavory newsness. Um, those of you know, a couple weeks ago, actually probably a month ago now, Youthia Torment of Resurrection was a game that came out with a Kickstarter that went live, uh, backed, made its funding goal, then canceled out because there weren't enough physical backers. Strange situations. And the company eventually was like, we can't make ends meet, we closed down, we're sad, sorry. And so sadness abounded and torment, torrential torment reigned. However, good news, Torment of Resurrection has been resurrected. That's right, it's been picked up by a publisher, and there is now announcements to begin or to revisit the Kickstarter, which will provide both the original copy and all of the great things they had planned for their expansion as well. So, true to their word, there was Torment, and then there was Resurrection. Another moves? GMT is getting ready to, to ship off two games that I have been highly highly anticipating one for a couple years and one for many years uh, flashpoint south china sea should be shipping now and should be available hopefully as soon as possible for people gimme 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 and mr president a game that has been around for a long time is finally close to getting ready to get shipped yay i'm looking forward to it this is more of an abstract res representation of acting or the the pits and perils and, and and passions and glory of being mr president another news uh those of you who have played fields of fire fields of fire 2 for many many years it's been mentioned that the rule book is not necessarily the easiest to figure out uh, that there's been uh, issues where people really want to like the game, but that it's been difficult to learn. Um, there's a huge, huge uh, initiative going on right now to redo the rules for the uh, to to do a third edition of the rulebook for Fields of Fire, particularly with an upcoming game, Fields of Fire: The Bulge, which is an expansion to Fields of Fire and gives gives it kind of a, of a set of of. Um, just kind of canned missions a little more than just what comes in the box. It's more specifically tailored to this particular Battle of the Bulge. I uh, I signed up to be a beta tester. I uh, didn't I didn't make the cut for the veteran group because <laughs> I ain't no veteran at this game, and so I signed up to be part of the the weenie group or the the sorry the the group of people who are just acting as if they're starting out. Now I have dabbled with it in the past. I really liked it. I, the rulebook wasn't that terribly. It, it t you, you needed to focus on it. The thing is, being a single-player single, single player game, you needed to focus on it, and you needed to work through it. Zillions of questions answered on online, etc. There's now some amazing video tutorials about it, too. But this should help smooth and streamline the game for people getting on board even more. So, uh, really looking forward to it. I can't, I don't know how much I can say or not say, but I've started to sort of play test the third edition rules from the eyes of someone just opening it up in a vanilla stance. But much effort is being made towards it, and I, for one, am pretty excited to see the third edition rules released. Uh, Furnace is a game, one of the one of my favorite filler games, uh, in that it it was a crunchy, meaty, uh, low component, high output game about industri industrial times and their coming of age. Uh, there's a new expansion headed out to us later this year called Interbellum. Interbellum will provide solo play, which is something I appreciate because I'm just a solo kind of guy, and uh, extra options, which is great because most expansions should probably give you more rather than less. Uh, and finally, Days of Wonder, if you've been wondering what they've been doing for these days, is uh, coming out with a game after a long time. Their last game, I think, was Deep Blue that I got. Anyway, that wasn't... Uh, they used to be like the premier, like, mainstay, the staple. Like, they'd come out with a game and it'd be like, ta-da! You know, high quality, la la la. Life has changed, many years have gone by. But they're coming out with Heat, Pedal to the Metal. This is a Formula One racing game 
with the idea being you basically are racing. You're not betting so much. You're just you're racing. It's supposed to be more interesting. I mean, it's like Formula D is going to be hard to top, but they've got ways and they feel confident about it. So let's see if they do it. So anyway, let's get to my question of the week. Question of the week. This came up as an interesting thing this week because... Well, not weeks, but the last couple weeks, because in the local group, one of the things we discussed and talked about was, does a game, should a game have every single thing you need to be able to play it in the box? This was brought on because a couple of games came out that weren't, they weren't, pl they weren't print and play, they weren't test, but they're like, you need to, you need to hunt down two, 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 uh, uh, you know, one d sixes, one, you know, six sided dice, and. Uh, you know, or and then you needed, you know, it's, it's pad of paper stuff, where basically there was there was not the components you needed to play the game were not in the box. I was on the side of I feel like if I was ever going to make a game or if I ever do, I want I want every someone to be able to receive this box, open it up, and begin playing without no without any dependencies required externally. This is the same way I feel about uh, this is why probably why I pack everything expansions inside one box. I take one box. I just I I'm a big believer. Um, in the way I arrange things and how I how I set up games that you take you know like I put all the all the things a player needs in one bag and say here you go here you go I don't differentiate them that way everyone kinda has their own little turf their territory so for me I would not be thrilled about having a game that says you need to you need to find these these things to join in unless a it was a plug or play or b there are some exceptions like I always like it when people provide like a pencil or something, if you're going to do a, a you know draw and roll and write whatever, like providing a pencil seems like a great idea. They're cheap, whatever. I don't know the full logistics of it, but um, but to me, you know, it always is nice when you can just go. I bought this. I open it. Here it is. Oh, we got to go hunt down and find. Especially if you're bringing these games to a table. Like the counter argument that I got was someone going, I think it's a service to people not to include them because so many people already have these. People probably have a thousand 1D6s. And I'm like, that's true if you're a hardcore board gamer. But why? W I would never want to make that presumption. I would always want to be like, hey, even if you're, even if you are a hard game board gamer, maybe some of you's not. Maybe it is. If you've got so many one d sixes lying around, like great, that's fantastic. That said, I still think that there's a completionist in me just goes, give people what they need to be able to play the game without having to hunt stuff down. You know, I take this box, I take it to to play at a person's house, and I go, crap, I forgot to grab one of the 1D6s out of one of the other games and stuff like that. So, what are your thoughts? Do you think a game absolutely should have all the pieces inside it? Do you think there are some mitigating factors? Another one would be games that are like like writing, and they don't give you the, the erasable markers. Some games do that. They're like, meh, you know, and some of them come, and I'm like, well, I could probably find better ones myself. But anyway, let me know your thoughts. No big deal. It happens rarely enough that it's not a big deal. And I'm, you know, most I think it doesn't even need to be said that if you have custom components, of course you're going to put them in a the box. I think the the idea is just if you happen to, ha you know, like if if it, you know these are so available that anybody could pick one up. But I still say, give it all, put it all in the box, baby. Uh, because I never want to take my eye off of the Fatui. Uh, in, in video games, we have the Fatui. The first time user experience can be a tutorial, it can be a walkthrough, it can be like, you know, hints, whatever. But anytime, I'm always on the idea that like, I never want to, I never want to throw the, you know, throw, throw the ladder off the wall so new players can't climb up it as easily. I want to, I have this intrinsic desire to never forget the vanilla eyes of someone who doesn't have the battalions of share of shelves as their rear guard going into a gaming, a gaming uh, session. So anyway, there we go. Blah, blah, blah. Let's get to my three games. I present to you Exhibit A, Your Honor. Barnyard Roundup. You know why I bought this? I had a very specific reason, and it's it's not the box, it's not the game, it's not the designer. It's the fact that it was exactly the right price to get exactly $99 to get free shipping. That's how cool this game is. Anyway, I picked it up, Barnyard Roundup. Um, it's by James Hudson, Druid City. He's done some other things. Um, you know, so, some, some other games like uh, Wonderland's War and... Oh, what is that other one that had like the the three little piggies fairy tales, Grimm's Grimm's Tales? Anyway, Barnyard Roundup is a game. Uh, it's a much more simple game. You're like you trick other farm hands by playing cards from your hand, declaring what they are, and then giving the other players uh, a choice to decide if you're lying or not. 
uh, you know, if you choose correctly, they get the, if they choose, they get the valuable animal. If you outwit them, you get the card. Um, I've seen so many variations of this game, and I don't actually think we'll ever play it, because I didn't realize that it had that element. One of the things my kids early on said, and they, they made it clear, is they were not interested in any game that involved lying. They did not want to trick or fool people. They just like, I would, there's so many other games to play. I don't want to play a game where I'm trying to fool people. I don't mind not telling people what I have on my, for my cards in my hand, but I don't want to try lying to them. And I'm like, you know what, that's actually a good, a good point. There's enough of that going on in the world, so I'm probably just going to give this to someone. Anyway, but cooler is Wild Serengeti. Wild Serengeti. It's the wild life. What band's that from? Anyway, Wild Serengeti was picked up because I thought it looked darn cool. It has some of the coolest little meeples. When they tell you that like, you don't even have to go like, this yellow cube represents a giraffe. It actually is a giraffe. It looks like a giraffe. And the, and the alligators are cool. This is a, a game I'll probably do a review on, but the idea is you have cards and you're trying to use, you're trying to pattern match animals on the terrain in a matching way, and then you get some bonus for it. And that's really the essence of the game. And finally, as we switch streams and honor those who fell in the years of 1347, this is Messina, 1347, not to be confused with Loggins, uh, because they both together made a great band, but apparently Messina wanted to branch out on his own, so good luck to him. Uh, I'm sure Loggins will do fine. Anyway, the uh, the pool, this is a game from Vladimir Shuchi, he, uh, Underwater Cities, uh, Pregna Rapa Kappa Tupi, one of those other games. Anyway, uh, Messina 1347 is all about, merch is about the Black Plague. So you're, you're a noble family with land holdings in the countryside around Messina. Uh, you're, you attempt to rescue people from the plague by relocating them to their estates. The plague will worsen, the players will build small independent communities while attempting to control the plague with fire. I have no idea how good this is to me, but generally speaking, I've enjoyed Vladimir's games. Uh, Underwater Cities is probably still, well, uh, there's so many good ones. There's many good ones that he's done, so I'm looking forward to give diving into that one and we'll see if it merits a review that's that for three games now it's time for the the, the last and final tim machine okay so as we get into the last two years of 2011 and 2012 i don't feel like it's much of a time machine more since it's literally only 10 years ago uh i guess that's kind of time machine-y, but it's really more just like um, like a Bluetooth teleportation uh, machine-y. And so I'm going to be switching to something different. I don't know what yet. If you guys have any ideas on something that might be kind of a fun, entertaining thing, let me know. Um, I, I, do, I have enjoyed Tim Machine greatly. I think it's one of my favorites to have done, to be honest with you. So without further ado, let me stroke my beard and let's get on to 2011. 2011 was all about the European debt crisis. Now, in 2008, we had the, uh, the recession that hit the U.S. economy pretty hard. I know I was affected by it. Many people were. I was affected by it less than many people were. Uh, but... Still, it was it was a thing. I, I know somewhat about it, but I'm very curious from my European friends how they viewed uh, the European debt crisis of 2011, how it affected them. Um, that'd be great. Like, I'd love to know more about that. The top movie was Captain America. I watched that one. I watched that one hundreds of times. Captain America is probably one of my favorite movies uh, of the Marvel series by far. I just really liked it. As someone who grew up with black and white World War II movies and John Wayne movies and and just, uh, you know, just tons and tons of just you know, old-fashioned movies, I, I loved just the nostalgia of Captain America, you know, I Rock on, Captain. Anyway, the song was Rollin' in the Deep by Adele. Now, I know that I've heard this song a lot, at least in two or three elevators, uh, but uh, I'm pretty sure it played on the airwaves. It seemed to be highly popular. Uh, so, yeah, there you go. And the book was A Dance with Dragons by George R. R. Martin, who has yet to actually complete his series, and many people wonder if he ever will. And that said... Uh, I think we all know a little bit about Game of Thrones by now, if not directly, then indirectly, so there you go. What did I play the most? Well, this was the year of King of Tokyo, and what a hit it was. What a glorious hit it was. To come out of nowhere, Richard Garfield, Garriott, Gar Garfield, 
Richard Garfield, sorry, Gary, it was Ultima. Richard Garfield coming out with a, yet another fun, fun love and hit. King of New York came afterwards, but for some reason it was a little bit too gamey, like hardcore gamey. King of Tokyo, you could throw at anybody, and everybody just had a blast with it. Uh, what were the top games? Mage Knight took my world by storm for its uh, clever use of cards. Uh, top and top card, bottom card, powering up cards, playing quite that sucker man. I we played a game, Lord, we played a game. Uh, the first game I ever played that it was introduced to, I played with friends, and it took seven hours. Um, we were expecting it to take two or three. Uh, and then uh, Lord of the Rings, the card game, which I initially despised, and then grew to absolutely love over the years. It was one of the, it was the game that taught me that my first or even second, third, or fifth impressions aren't always accurate, and that never rule a game out because you never know when you might have been wrong. And Takenoko, pandas, bamboo, stay away. Uh, what game would I have bought then if I'd known then what I know now? Well, that's Gears of War. I probably would have picked that one up. It's around here somewhere, but by now I'm just like, nah, whatever. All right, let's move on to 2012, 10 years ago today. The top story was Michael Phelps winning his 19th medal in the Summer Olympics, which is astounding because I haven't even gotten my first one yet. Uh, top movie was The Avengers, which was a, you know, the amalgamation of many superheroes all together to fight the forces of evil all over all over the, the, the globe. But man, what company it had. It, I mean, there were a lot of movies that year. There was uh, Dark Knight Rises, culminating the, the trilogy, the Batman trilogy, the one I liked the most. Uh, the Hobbit uh, is continuing on, and over it's the second or the last one, but anyway, yeah, the the Hobbit, that was out, was that when 3D glasses were all the rage? No, nobody even bothers. And then The Amazing Spider-Man, which is a reboot of the original, which I have actually, in the last month, watched all of, I'm, I'm on the second to last Spider-Man, I watched all the three originals with Tobey Maguire, the two amazing ones, and now I'm going to finish it off. Why? Because, um, somebody that I used to know by Gautier, was the song of the year, which I thought was actually pretty clever. In fact, the initial riff of it sounds a lot like Monkey Island when you first start out in the game, so maybe that's why I liked it so much. The book, which I did not in any way, shape, or form read and have no desire to, is Fifty Shades of Grey by E.L. James. Now, what game did I play the most? Legendary. That's right. Uh, a friend of mine uh, developed a system for Legendary, Devin Lowe, and... Uh, we uh, we play tested the snot out of that thing, and that continues to be you know my my great my little thing is like, the setup still takes a while, but man, what a what a way to amalgamate Marvel heroes in such an awesome way. The game still has legs. That's how awesome it is. What were the top games? War of the Ring. War of the Ring was awesome. War of the Ring is just the consummate War of the Ring game. Android Netrunner still fantastic. Boggles the mind how great it is. And Smash Up. Smash them together, make them work. What game would have I bought then if I'd known then what I know now? Zulkin. Just because I don't have it, and I like the little gears. So anyway, that's it. I love talking with you all. I hope you all have a great July, and I'll be back hopefully next week. See you later, and next time on Hairbrain Games.